When 14-year-old Daisy Coleman was found freezing in a garden in the early hours of the morning, her family's lives changed forever. Not only was she found close to death in the cold, but it soon became apparent that she'd also been sexually assaulted. As the Colemans attempted to seek justice, the small town where they lived cruelly turned against Daisy and ostracised the family. This is the story of a major injustice of a girl who went through so much tragedy, but in the aftermath of a trauma, poured her heart and a soul into trying to help people and to advocate for other survivors. This is the genuinely harrowing case of Daisy Coleman. No! Hi guys, welcome back to the channel. Thank you for joining me as ever. Today's case is one I wanted to cover. It was one I was aware of, but wow. As I started to research more and more, I realized I only knew pieces of the jigsaw puzzle and placing them all together meant that throughout this case, I kept taking sharp intakes of breath and just pausing. One of the reasons for that is there is some familiarity throughout it. There is a common experience and thread. And whenever that occurs, you can't help but feel a connection that's quite unique. But also it's just the absolute amount of trauma that the Coleman family have endured. And if you know this case, but don't know the threads that are within it, then I suggest listening, even if you've heard other people talk about it. I hope I do it justice. I genuinely, genuinely do, as I always do. So those of you new to my channel, my channel is crime content based. I release all my content on Wednesdays and Sundays. Crime consistency is key, so you will always get those released on those days at infinitum. If you want to subscribe, please do, and also get your notifications on so you don't miss any episodes. Also, I'm gonna be dropping in extra episodes from now on. I'm really trying to record more content. But as you know, the research is a big part of that and therefore it isn't always possible for me to find the time because I'm on tour with The Serial Killer Next Door and also Killer Cults, Catch Me in UK Theatres. Also, I'm writing my second book. My first one is out in September, The Serial Killer Next Door. If you want to get that, you can pre-order it here in the link below or you can wait till September and you can go into major bookstores and it will be available there. It will also be available on Audible because I will be recording it. Let's kick off with today's case and talk about, like I said, a story that genuinely made me keep catching my breath because the unexpected twists and turns are relatively unique, I would say. And yet at the same time, the reactions to them are completely understandable. So let's talk about Catherine Daisy Coleman, who is obviously known as Daisy. Then later down the line, she becomes known to her friends as Kat. She was born on March the 30th, 1997 in Albany. She was born to her father, Michael, and mother, Melinda. They were a lovely middle-class family, I suppose you would say. Michael was very well educated. He was a physician and Melinda worked as a veterinarian. So clearly, income-wise, they're going to be very comfortable. But also, we're talking about ambitious people. We're talking about a happy marriage. We're talking about a very loving, connected family. And that is one of the things that you will hear throughout this. The Coleman family are a deeply connected and loving family. It is what they breathe day to day. And they are living this beautiful life where to all intents and purposes, everything is going perfectly. The parents have amazing careers. The children are growing up together. So she has three younger brothers, Tristan, Logan, and Charlie and Daisy is really close to all of them. And this should be a story of just great success. But then sliding doors moments happen. We all know that. And in 2009, Michael Coleman, the father in the picture is killed in a car accident. The family were basically on the way to watch Charlie in a wrestling tournament. Charlie is the eldest son and he's also a really great athlete and he has this acumen that is very powerful when it comes down to sports. So understandably, they're a very supportive, loving family. They're all going to watch him. What kind of commitment are we talking about? They're huge. The fact that everyone wants to be present for Charlie. But sadly, the car goes over some black ice. Michael loses control. He skids into a ravine with a car overturning. Daisy and Logan were actually in the car with him. 
they thankfully survived, but clearly the fact that their father didn't will have led to horrific trauma. Melinda, the mother in this story, she's actually traveling at the time in the car behind. She gets out, she's clearly medically trained, so she tries to resuscitate Michael, but she can't do. So essentially, they lose this incredibly important human being in their lives. Melinda said that her husband was like a teddy bear. People wouldn't mess with him. He was a six foot three big guy, a bodybuilder, but he was just really cuddly and soft on the inside. He was funny, meant to have a really natural rapport with children. They just felt really comfortable with him. They felt like he was a safe place and a safe space to be around. And he would sometimes flex his pecs just to make them laugh whilst he was even having to go ahead and give children injections because bear in mind, he was a physician. So when he's inoculating kids, etc., he knows that they're gonna react in a way that's often scared or pained. So playing around like that with them, making him as the doctor seem more human, less authoritarian, less scary, it means that he's so empathic. And we're talking about the family losing that individual a man who goes out of his way to make other people feel really comfortable, a brilliant father who's very much at the centre of his children's world. And Melinda said that he absolutely loved his children more than anything else in the world. So his loss has an understandable, massive impact on the family, including Daisy, because Daisy was always considered a daddy's girl. And again, it's not because you love one child more than another, but if you've got three boys and you have a girl, it's a distinct relationship. You're gonna have a different relationship to the girl than you are the boy, just because ultimately, even though men and women are very similar in lots of ways, we're also very different in certain ways. And so you're gonna have rearing a child who's male or female on the whole, not always, I appreciate, but on the whole, you're going to have distinctions. And for a father to have a daughter, I think there is that additional protective mechanism simply because you don't know what it's like to be a girl if you're a boy. You know, ultimately it's a different experience when you're growing up. So therefore, as a man, you have these expectations, potential biases, stereotypes, which mean that you might treat that child differently because you don't understand the unique experience of being that gender. So that's another reason why dads will often gravitate to protection where that girl is concerned and gravitate to being a bit more gentle, not roughhousing in the same way that you might do with your lads because you haven't had the experience of being the child. So in this sense, there's a closeness between Daisy and her daddy. Now they relocate after this because understandably it's a tragedy and tragedy can follow people. So if you're in a scenario where you're living in a place where lots of people know you, and particularly when we're talking about a veterinarian and a physician, they're going to be well known in the community and people are going to be looking at them and they're going to understandably and rightfully feel sorry for the family because they've lost such an instrumental human being in their lives. But that can also be deeply problematic psychologically because it means that people are constantly viewing you through a lens that you don't want to always be behind. And some people can endure that, overcome it, move forward. For others, it's like the constant chipping away at the grief that you're trying to resolve because you're reminded by other people's perceptions this has happened to you. So they moved to Maryville, which is about an hour away from their home in Albany. And this desire to escape the area where everyone knows them as this tragic family who lost the patriarch was something that they believed might give them a new start. Melinda actually said that they didn't want to be living with ghosts. And I think the use of the term ghosts is really interesting because when we think about ghosts, we think about one individual. So in this case, the father's died. It's his ghost essentially because his presence is no longer there and yet is everywhere. But when you use the multiple as Melinda does, I think what she's saying personally is it's the ghosts of who they were. It's a sense of this is the life before the car accident and this is our life afterwards because you are absolutely changed by these experiences and you can never be the people that you were before. And there'll be lots of you listening right now who know exactly that feeling because you've gone through traumatic grief or just general grief and expected loss of somebody that you've loved dearly but has aged. You understand that the fracture it causes, though you can do something beautiful with it, it's something 
that reminds you that there was a you then and a you now. We get to January the 8th, 2012. At this point, Daisy is 14 years of age. She is going through the normal experience of being a teenager. You know, you're 14, but you think you're 40. It's just the way it works. You spend your entire youth on the whole, wanting to be older, wanting to grow up, wanting to do things that you think cool adults do. And then ironically, when you become an adult down the line, and then decades after that, you just want to be back to being young again and carefree. You don't want to be the adult on the whole because, let's be honest, it can be challenging being a young person, but you're not tending to actually have to go to work or pay a mortgage. So essentially stress-wise, being younger generally, not always, but on the whole can be less stressful than being older. But you want to play at being a grown-up. And Daisy is no different to most teenagers who feel that way. So she sneaks out of her home through a bedroom window. She also takes with her her friend who's Paige Pankhurst. She was 13, so younger, in fact, than Daisy. They creep out around 1am, and who hasn't done that? I know that some of you will be like, I've never done that, Emma. I was a very well-behaved child. What are you talking about? I was literally dragged back in from my bedroom window by my father when I was 14, so I can say I identify deeply with this scenario unfolding. Now, the two of them have been actually drinking, which isn't ideal. When you're 13 and 14, your tolerance level is going to be incredibly low. Also, you haven't got the conscious understanding of what alcohol can do to you. You just think it's a bit naughty. You don't realise that it can be pretty catastrophic on your body and the way your body functions. And you're tending to not have an idea of how much alcohol is a safe level. I mean, adults have a problem with that anyway, but... For the most part, as you get older, because your experience of drinking becomes more normalised, you understand limits. Kids tend not to do that. And also, Daisy had been messaging a friend of Charlie, her older brother. So 17-year-old Matthew Barnett and her had actually been in contact with each other. This was on a semi-regular basis. And that particular evening, he says, do you want to meet up? And understandably, when she gets a text that reads, you want to come drink with me and chill? She replies, OMFG, sweet. Then she wrote, do you want me to bring alcohol? So at this point, Barnett picks Daisy and Paige up, takes them back to his house. She knows he's friends with her big brother. When that's the case, you immediately assume that it's safe. Of course you do. We've all been in those circumstances. When you actually logically go through the thought process that makes you arrive at the conclusion you are safe, it doesn't really make that much sense. Everyone knows someone, Ted Bundy will have had friends. The assumption that, oh, there you are, Ted. Sure, I'll go home with you because I know Martin, who is my brother, and he has some experience of being around you. That doesn't actually make you safe, does it? But we just have this bias of security where if you know somebody I know, then cool, it's all gonna be okay. So ultimately, she's excited. Her and Paige are hanging out with older boys. It feels cool. They've got a bit of Dutch courage because they've got a little bit tipsy. And now they're having an opportunity to go and hang out at his house and hopefully have some fun. Also, when you are 14 and 13, it is completely normal to be attracted to boys that are older than you and girls that are older than you. It's just part of what makes people who are slightly older than us seem more attractive. It's their age. You think they're more experienced, more worldly wise. They're not. Just a couple of years older. But you put all these ideas about who they are compared to who they actually are based on the fact that they're a few months older than you. So the girls end up climbing through the window into his basement and at this point, there are four other male friends present. They're all drinking. Doesn't take long for Paige to end up going into a bedroom with one of the young boys. Daisy then continues drinking. She's drinking in absolute excess with the other guys. And bear in mind, she's a slight framed girl. She said that she was apparently drinking from the bitch cup, which is a cup that's filled with alcohol. If you don't drink the contents, basically you're a bitch. So I would last for one round. But she also was drinking straight from the bottle. So we can see that she's got absolutely no idea of how much alcohol she's consuming and the impact that's going to have on her body. 
And of course, once you're under the influence, you often lose your inhibitions. And on top of that, you become less in control of your faculties. And so when somebody is making you drink more, you just kind of go ahead and doing it. And the main reasoning she said that she carried on drinking was she just wanted to show them that she could handle her alcohol, that she wasn't this little girl, because she's obviously very aware of her age. She wants to impress them. She doesn't want to seem like a lightweight. But these are much older boys. I know they're still kids. I know 17, you're not massively grown up in any way, shape or form. I appreciate it. But you are considerably older than a 14 year old. You've been 14. We know the different stages of maturity and adolescence. At 14, a lot of girls are just beginning or have just been within the few years of it. Whereas at 17, you no know, boys are getting to the end of it. So they are much more aware in certain areas and much more experienced in certain areas, certainly when it comes down to things like intimacy. And they know they've got two young girls with them and they will be aware of the moral and ethics and issues regarding that. Now, in the early hours of that morning, around 5 a.m., Daisy's mum, Melinda, wakes up with her brother, Charlie, to really strange noises. They go outside, and there, to the absolute horror, they find Daisy just lying in the garden. She's only wearing a T-shirt and sweatpants, and it had been a really cold night. And to evidence this, her hair was actually wet, and because it was wet, it had frozen to the floor. That's how cold she was. And she was barely conscious. She was really struggling to talk. They get her into the house. And at this point, Melinda, who fortunately, as we know, has medical training, she thinks that there is potential signs of frostbite on her hands. So she starts to run a bath because she wants to gradually raise her temperature. Because bear in mind, at this moment in time, they just know that she's been outside and they found her frozen in that way. She's potentially thinking that she'd gone out, maybe she'd had a drink, come back, fell asleep outside. She's not necessarily thinking about anything malevolent having occurred to her daughter. So when she starts to undress Daisy, basically to get her into the bath, that's when she notices her groin and her thigh because both of those areas are very, very red. And she automatically realises that she's not just dealing with her daughter who's very, very cold and in danger potentially because she's been out with the elements. She realises that it's likely that something predatory has occurred also. So understandably, they get themselves into the car, they go to the hospital. At this point, they use a rape kit and do tests to check what's happened and to find DNA of the perpetrator. They also measure Daisy's blood alcohol level. It's 134.9 HP, which is very high and understandably would mean that she would have not been competent to have been involved in any kind of consenting actions, even if she'd been over the age of consent. But we're talking about a child here who neither can legally consent and certainly cannot physically consent because of this blood alcohol level. It turns out Paige, she was also sexually assaulted. Now she had told the guy that she was with, she didn't want to do anything with him. She kept pushing him away. She kept saying no. She said that when she actually came out of the bedroom, she knew that Daisy was in another bedroom with Barnett. And when he opened the door and he came out, she could actually see physically that Daisy was sprawled out half on the bed, half on the floor. She was unable to talk. She was apparently completely incoherent. Now, at that point, game over either way, anyway, however you look at it. This is a child. She can't even speak. She cannot consent in any way, shape or form to any kind of sexual contact. End of. Paige also said that the boys literally had to drag Daisy to the car to take her back home. So she can't even walk. She's paralytic. It's as simple as that. When they get back to Daisy's house, they said to Paige that they were going to keep her outside for a bit until she sobered up. So Paige went into the house and then subsequently passed out. But they obviously just left Daisy in the elements, did absolutely nothing about it and chanced her dying. So when I'm telling this story, I'm trying to insist on the gravity of it for this reason. People may watch and say, she went to that place to hang out with friends. She got drunk. 
she wanted to be with Bennett because he's a little bit older, but not too massively distinct in age. She wasn't a victim. I'm not saying the majority, I know the majority of you will be totally on the page with me, but some people will hit this video, get to this point, and that's what you'll think. And I understand it because of the familiarity a lot of people feel with relationships of those age gaps in school and college. But even if you have a different opinion to me on this and believe that she therefore has a level of complicity in this scenario, you cannot deny that she was paralytic, not just to the degree where she could not legally consent, even if she felt she wanted to, but that then, because she was in such a terrible state, inebriated, they dumped her body outside and she could have died. They willingly did that and they got her back to the home. So they weren't in the state that she was in, clearly. They took two teenagers, one who went into the house okay, but passed out, could have vomited and died. And the other, to all intents and purposes, would have died had her mother and brother not found her. We are talking about the most selfish acts beyond belief, aside from being criminal. Those boys used, those girls had no care, no compassion, no actual understanding of the gravity of their actions, clearly when it came down to how dangerous they were in the alcohol consumption that they ensured the girls involved themselves in, and also the level of willingness to just leave them to potentially die. That's the kind of mindset of selfishness and arrogance and superiority we're dealing with. That's why I'm being so insistent on making clear why I believe this is such a grave crime. Now, when Daisy is interviewed by the police, which is harrowing, can we all remember, we're talking about a 14-year-old girl here. Believe me, I've been involved in lots of cases where young girls have been raped. Very sadly, that's the case because of my work in trauma and sexual offences. However, one of the most traumatising things that a lot of the girls talk about is the interviews that they have to go through. It's so intimate. A lot of them feel that the officers are maybe looking at them like they've got some kind of responsibility and they can walk out of those interviews very, very traumatised and sometimes feeling like they've done something wrong. Not all the time, but let me tell you, it's happened too many times in my career to pretend it doesn't happen more often than it should. So she's really honest. I would say one of the clear things about Daisy is honesty runs through her core. So when she's asked questions, she says, yeah, I've been in touch with Barnett. We've been texting each other about once a month. Sometimes she'd actually see if he'd go and get alcohol for her and her friends. Also, he'd been round to her house in the past because he was friends with her big brother, Charlie. Both Daisy and Paige said, yeah, we were drinking vodka and tequila at my house. As far as Daisy was concerned, she was saying that's where they were. And that was before they were picked up by Barnett. So these girls aren't holding back. They're just saying exactly what happened. They're not trying to sugarcoat it. They're telling the truth. But then an officer says to Daisy, could Barnett have thought that she consented to the sex? I'm disturbed by that question. I really am. Are we saying that a young person who can't consent, who's absolutely inebriated, should be asked whether the perpetrator could have got it wrong and maybe she'd been okay with the scenario. Instantly it's victim blaming. But of course she's 14 and she probably does quite like Barnet and she's probably a bit scared about all this playing out. And so she says he was drinking too. So yeah, he could have. Barnet, of course, says that Daisy and he have consensual sex. Just gonna throw it out there. And again, feel free to school me if you feel that you should. But when most of us have sex, we don't end up with big red marks on our thighs and groin area, even when we've had sex for the first time, because usually it's not horrifically rough. If somebody has got those kind of injuries, it tends to be that they've been treated very poorly, unless they've consented to that, because that's a kink they have. For the most part, we're talking about a 14-year-old girl, that's not what she's gonna be going for in her sexual experiences. So. The very fact that she's got those marks on her body means, in my opinion, that she's been used as an object. 
He also says she drank alcohol at his house. She was already apparently buzzed when he picked her up because she'd been drinking, but he didn't think she was drunk. But yes, he did know that she was drinking beforehand. When he's interviewed, he did admit that he'd known that Daisy was 14, so he knew her age. He also said that one of his friends took a video of him and Daisy whilst they were both naked, but apparently had deleted it. Police weren't able to retrieve that. So at this point, rightly, he's arrested for the sexual assault of Daisy. Understandably, Daisy's whole family are shocked by the events that have unfolded, but Daisy's brother Charlie, who's friends with Barnett, said that when it came down to his character, he wouldn't put it past Barnett at all. He's just got that kind of personality and character where he probably would take advantage of his sister. But he was really surprised that three of the other boys who were involved did anything and were happy to see that play out because he considered two of them to be his best friends. And also he thought they'd protect his sister. So it was quite blindsiding for him. They also hadn't even told him that Daisy had been there that night. So they'd kept secrets about this thing playing out. When it came down to Paige's attacker, well, he admitted that he'd raped her. He said, yep, yeah, she'd been drunk. She'd said no to his advances. So he just got convicted for her attack again, rightly so. And I'm actually respectful of somebody who takes responsibility and accountability. It's harrowing that this played out. It's harrowing as well that this girl will have had her life traumatized. So at least he said, yes, I did it. I'm guilty, bang to rights. And at the end of the day, he was convicted accordingly. So what we're talking about now are two young girls who've been horrendously raped. It's clear cut, they have been raped. But as opposed to there being any compassion towards these girls, it just isn't the case. So the aftermath of the rape allegations were horrific for the Coleman family. So Daisy just gets bullied constantly by her peers. She shouted at in the corridors, people calling her a liar, a slut. And get this, this is going to take your breath away. Daisy, the victim, was also suspended from the cheerleading team because it became known that she'd been drinking. Because of course, no cheerleader ever in the history of cheerleaders has ever had a drink. In fact, just give me a minute. I'm just going to get my cheerleading manual. Yes, uh, 0.4.4b. No cheerleader in the history of cheerleading has ever had an alcoholic drink. If a cheerleader ever has a drink, they will automatically be suspended pending further investigations. Yep, it's there. As if there would be no cheerleaders if alcohol got you suspended or expelled because most, if not all cheerleaders, because they tend to be popular girls, will have, I don't know, a sniff occasionally of wine. Does it count if they find out you had a glass of wine with your family at Christmas? Does it? You know, you're around with your mates, you're around with your family. Somebody comes along, probably a grandfather who I don't know, has a penchant for port and cheese and just pours you a little sniff and you have it. Is it like, well, that's it then. Game over for your cheerleading career, kid. But again, what is that saying to you? It's like she is the victim and she's being treated like she's the enemy and that as if she's caused this issue. And she must have been devastated, absolutely devastated. She's going through the trauma of what's occurred and now nobody wants to talk to her. She's getting slagged off by everyone in school. Everybody knows her business and something that she holds dear has been taken away from her. The teachers in that school, you all need re-educating. I really hope one of the teachers involved watches this video because if that's policy, someone really needs to think about how appropriate it is exercising it with a victim of rape. Just throwing it out there. Charlie, who's a really popular athlete, and obviously her brother, he's really well known in the school, people love him, suddenly he's cut dead, just ostracised by his friends. So he had teammates, for example, in the wrestling team, etc., but just gets excluded when he goes to school literally the following Monday. So the rape occurs, from that point onwards, he's frozen out. He was also harassed. In fact, on the night, of his final home wrestling match, Charlie was booed whilst being honoured. He'd been 
relatively excited because he was really close with some of the wrestlers and the families, so he'd felt safe in that environment. He said he was the only senior and he went out for his ceremony and he said he just remembered looking up in the corner of the gym and he could see Matthew's friends, which is Barnett in this case, and he said they were booing me. I didn't understand why, but it went around school and people were joking about how funny it was. The shame any of those young people who are grown up now should feel should be immense. To do that to somebody is grotesque on any level, but to do that to somebody who is the brother of a victim of rape is inconceivably cruel. And yet that's what happened. Also, it gets worse. The home's vandalised. Melinda, Daisy's mother, they let go of her from her job at Southpaw's veterinary clinic with absolutely no explanation. Shame on them. This case, you will understand, connects with me on a very visceral and cerebral level and you will understand as I tell the story because believe me, we're only just getting going on how unjust this whole case is and the ramifications are distressing and traumatic and permanent. So she's sacked basically, for no reason whatsoever. I hope whoever worked at Southpaw's veterinary clinic has felt the bite of karma that happened just two weeks after the alleged rape. And understandably, she believes because the word is spread in this really tight knit community, there's a safety of Maryville that she believed would exist for her family because everyone seems to know one another. Everyone seems to know each other's business and that can feel really alluring when you've had a trauma as they had. So she went there to become a hub of a community, part of something to make them feel whole again. And instead it's just turned against them. And part of that is because everybody does know each other and also because there are powerful generations of families who happen to inhabit the area. So of course, when you have generations of families who are quite successful, it certainly gives them a layer of power that they don't deserve. And it can also mean that they inhabit jobs in the community that give them a level of power too that can be very useful in circumstances like this. And the sheriff of Maryville would later say that you genuinely had to be careful who you were talking about because you never quite knew who the person was related to. So let's be clear. The motivation behind that hostility would have been that the family were loyal to the Barnett family. At the end of the day, Throw the victim and the family of the victim under the bus because, you know, we're mates with the Barnets. We don't want to upset the Barnets. At the end of the day, they've got some powerful links to the Barnets. So let's all head down, crack on, pretend that everything's all right. Hopefully not have your kid raped by one of the perpetrators. But nonetheless, just avoid reality and ostracise the actual family who deserve your care. Now the Colmans had moved to that area recently, so therefore they weren't as rooted in the area, which meant that they wouldn't have had as many strong friendships. So I guess the choice was that people severed their friendships towards them rather than chance getting on the wrong side of the Barnets because Matthew Barnet was actually the grandson of a former politician. And we all know politicians can have some pretty powerful influence and friendships and I would not doubt for a moment that they were not used effectively in this case. The trauma of what Daisy went through affected her massively. Melinda said that Daisy was really strong in the beginning, but then it just starts to wear you down and she just got into a really dark place. She started to feel like it was her fault. She began self-harming, she was burning herself. And this happens so often where people are traumatized sexually because their power has been taken, because they feel somehow that they are responsible, they internalize it. And because that becomes so overwhelming and it just inhabits and infests and infects every part of their being, every atom of their self, they can't manage the overwhelming burden of the emotional chaos. So they'll often deflect using a physical punishment because for a moment it will take them away from that feeling. And it will also in the same moment give them a level of being the abuser to themselves. Now they are abusing themselves because they feel that they are distasteful. They feel they are to blame. So it works on two levels and it's so devastating because we're talking about a young woman who just needs to be wrapped in care. She did nothing wrong. The Coleman family decide that they're not gonna stay in this hostile, bitter, nasty environment. 
So they decide to move back to Albany because they need to at least be in a place that once was safe before the traumatic loss of their lovely dad and husband. So this is what they do. But of course, people don't like to let things go. So they start attacking Daisy online. She's not even in the area now, but she's getting messages such as, why don't you just slit your wrists? Honestly, there is a belief in research when we look at the mindsets of trolls. So a lot of people will go, oh, keyboard warriors. Oh, you're not so brave sat behind there. And yeah, it's nice, isn't it? To have this impression that somebody who sat as a keyboard warrior being horrible to other people behind screens, that they aren't necessarily processing what they're doing or that they're this kind of sad, lonely individual who's just got no life and therefore they're just utilising this as an option because they're dealing with their own self-hatred. And I wish that were the case, but that stereotype is often not true. When we look at really hardcore trolls, those individuals who just really like to destroy people, absolutely wish to just break them down in every way, shape and form. What we see personality wise is they often have a dark triad. So Machiavellian, narcissistic and psychopathic characteristics and traits. Also, people wanna bring sadism into that because of the fact that the sadistic quality of their nature is what really motivates them. So those kind of human beings, they're the worst of the worst. So some of those are the ones who constantly perpetuate this kind of nastiness and negativity. And inciting somebody to want to kill themselves and they're a victim of rape is beyond unbelievable. Also, their home in Maryville gets burned down. Literally gets set on fire. Now, thankfully, it occurs after they moved out, but they could have been in it. They actually didn't find a cause for the fire, which is a bit weird. I guess I'm going to throw it out there. Arson. Why maybe didn't they get it found out? Was it because somebody knew somebody? Who knew somebody? I don't know, I'm just saying it feels a little bit convenient. These kind of things happen, and yet somehow the reality of it is minimised. It's really sinister. What if the person who set the house on fire didn't even know whether they weren't there anymore and would have been happy to see them all burn to death? We get to January 2014, and Daisy does something that is awful and at the same time, for many of us, understandable because she is in a very, very dark place. She takes an overdose of Benadryl. She also takes some prescription drugs. She, at some point during this experience, tells her brother Logan that she's seeing ghosts. So she's hallucinating. He, at this point, is a lovely brother. He tells his mom and they realize that Daisy is indeed hallucinating and they call an ambulance. On the way to hospital, she was literally screaming that she was falling down a black hole. And I feel that is such a powerful statement because yes, she was hallucinating. I understand that when people hallucinate, they do go through bad trips at times. And therefore the feeling of falling down a black hole will be something that certain people can relate to if they've experienced and endured that horrible feeling. But when you say I'm falling down a black hole and you've been through what she's been through, you can't help but also see that as an expression of where she is emotionally, an expression of feeling like she is in a black hole that she's trapped. Melinda said that in the days after that overdose, when she was in hospital, Daisy was apparently babbling and incoherent, so she seriously tried to kill herself. She was scared as a mother that her daughter would never be okay again. But then she starts to recover, she starts to sound normal, and she ends up telling her mum, I'm really sorry, it was such a stupid thing for me to do, but unfortunately this would be one of multiple suicide attempts. And my father killed himself, it's coming up for five years this year. It still feels like it was a second ago. Sometimes it feels like it was a million years ago, all in the same moment and breath. My father also tried to take his life prior to successfully doing so. And you never, ever lose the fear. It just resides with you. And the prelude to the final acts is something that is very difficult to articulate, even though I've lived it, because it is so 
breathtakingly dread inspiring and it's something fortunately that most of us won't have to endure and I don't want people to endure it but just to relate to this I know where Melinda will have been and she's dealing with her daughter who's attempted to take a life my father at least had had a life but Daisy is a child still and this is all being caused by what's happened to her also, we have to remember that at this moment in time, she's dealing with this investigation. And of course, what does Barnett say? Well, she had consensual sex with me and I didn't do anything wrong. Now, initially I told you he's charged with felony assault, but these charges are dropped and he's actually allowed to plead guilty to the lesser charge of misdemeanor child endangerment. Misdemeanor child endangerment. Are you kidding me? That was in 2014. Do you know what he got for that? Bear in mind that they left her for dead. Bear in mind that she's now in a situation where she's harming herself and trying to end her life because she's been so broken by this. He gets two years probation and a four month suspended jail term. Now that's despite the fact that in Missouri law, when the victim is incapacitated by alcohol, it is considered to be a non-consensual sex situation. But basically, they argued that there was substantial doubt regarding whether Daisy was actually incapacitated at the time. Can we just stop for a minute? Just think about what I've said. How on earth did they get across this idea that Daisy wasn't incapacitated or they didn't know. She was found frozen to the floor. Of course she was incapacitated, she couldn't walk. There was a witness that said she was totally incoherent. There was a witness who was raped at the same address, whose assailant went to prison because of it. What on earth is going on when we're discussing there being any potential that she was anything other than incapacitated? Now, they put other conditions on Barnett, but they're irrelevant because he's free. Nothing happened. Everyone still likes him. His life is just cracking on as normal, isn't it? Because so-and-so's got contacts with so-and-so and that's how it'll have been. So these extra conditions included restitution of $1,800 to Daisy for counselling services. He wasn't allowed any alcohol. Understandably, he wasn't allowed contact with Daisy. He also got 100 hours of community service. He had to go through drug testing, substance abuse counselling, and also acknowledgement of wrongdoing, which was to be done by a verbal apology delivered by the Jackson County Prosecutor. There was quite a lot of speculation, shall we say, that the charges were dropped due to corruption. Really? It's a bit of speculation. A little bit of speculation that the law that stands didn't become the law in this case. A bit of speculation, a bit of corruption. Oh, I mean, I'm not saying there was any corruption. I'm not the kind of person that would be on this video saying that that sounds massively corrupt or that the Barnett's family could have had some kind of corrupt links that used their power corruptly. I'm not saying that I would never accuse somebody of being entirely corrupt and allowing a rapist to get away with something. That wouldn't be the way that I work. I'm just saying some people speculated that the charges were dropped due to corruption, especially because Barnett's grandfather was a well-known politician and therefore had access to influence to ensure that the charges were dropped. But again, it's just speculation, just a little bit of speculation that the Barnett family are massively corrupt. How would I know though? I'm just telling you what the research suggests. Also, Anonymous, we all know who Anonymous are, they're the online hacker group, they known for protests, cyber attacks, etc. They tweeted, in the US, it's only misdemeanor child endangerment if you rape a child. Good job, America. Absolutely correct, Anonymous. 100% correct. The prosecutor, Jean Peter Baker, said that though we might not like the outcome, the system works because it's based on evidence. And there was, quote, insufficient evidence for a sexual assault conviction with a prosecutor like that who even needs a defence? Anybody going into court with a scenario like this, all you need is a prosecutor like that if you're the actual individual who's accused. Because with a prosecutor like that, the defence is going to win every time.
The idea that there was not sufficient evidence when there was a witness who literally looked into the room and saw Daisy firstly naked, secondly incoherent, third almost unconscious, and then the parent and the brother finds Daisy frozen to a path because she's been dropped off completely inebriated, even though all of them admitted that they'd been drinking, the boys said it was heavily, one of the individuals went down for rape. Are we out of our mind here, Jean Peter Baker? Are you the worst prosecutor in the world, Jean Peter Baker? I think probably you're up there with some of the worst, aren't you? But that's what happened. Daisy commented after this that she was grateful that Brett Barnett had taken responsibility. She said, I promise that what happened on January the 8th, 2012 will not define me forever, but I don't think she had any awareness at this point just how broken she was by the events that played out. And he got away with freedom completely. It's unbelievable to me. We get to 2015. Daisy is working hard to try to make things better for other victims. She co-founds Safe BAE, which is safe before anyone else, along with other sexual assault survivors, and also her brother, Charlie. Now, the rate of assault is significantly higher in young people compared to other ages, so the organisation basically aims to educate people in middle and high school about consent and sexual violence prevention. She said, we work to enlist all school stakeholders in culture change by giving teens the tools to become peer-to-peer -peer advocates of sexual harassment, assault prevention, affirmative consent, safe bystander intervention, and they also ran education programs. So they aim to encourage people to understand how to protect people from discrimination based on sex in education programs. And Daisy actually became an advocate for sexual assault survivors. She was fighting for others, just trying to prevent essentially what happened to her from happening to anyone else. She was a woman's rights activist. Lots of survivors looked up to her as an inspiration. She even began an apprenticeship in Gentleman's Inc, which is a tattoo parlor in Missouri. She was turning out to be a really creative person and it was being used as a creative outlet. So she's an inspiration, an absolute inspiration to take the agony, the trauma, and to turn it into something so beautiful. And bear in mind, I'm not just blaming Barnett here. It took a village to destroy this girl. It took that place full of insidious, horrific human beings who turned against the family. They are what she's enduring pain-wise. They're the people who have amplified the agony that this girl has had to endure. We get to 2016 and Netflix did a really powerful documentary called Audrey and Daisy. It featured Daisy's story as well as that of Audrey Pot, and this is where I know the story from. Audrey was a 15-year-old girl She'd been sexually assaulted in 2012. Again, she'd passed out while she was drunk at a house party in California and three boys took naked photographs of her while she was being assaulted. Then they shared them online. Heartbreakingly, Audrey knew those boys and they were her friends. Simple as that. She trusted them. As a result, that poor girl ended up hanging herself 10 days after the assault, which was largely driven by the photos of her. They were circulating online, people were having fun. She just got bullied because she again was a victim. Prior to her death, she'd actually written, my life is ruined and I don't even remember how. I have a reputation for a night I don't even remember and the whole school knows. I totally understand that. When you're that age, it is like the game is over. Life is done, you're never gonna get past it. You haven't got distance travel from the event to be able to navigate it. You don't have the emotional resources and tools to be able to manage it. So 10 days, after that happened, she took her life. Her attackers actually did plead guilty to sexual assault. They were each sentenced to 30 to 45 days in prison for ruining a young girl's life, for humiliating her online, for spreading malicious lies, no doubt, in the early stages about her. She couldn't consent. Her friends did this to her. And now she's dead. 2014, Audrey's law was passed, which ensured that minors who were charged with sex crimes have to attend a sex offender program once they're released from prison, which is a good thing, but it's come too late. In the documentary, Daisy said, you begin to believe that all these bad things are saying about you are actually true. So your image of yourself completely changes and you kind of become a shell of yourself. 
you almost see that doing away with yourself is the only way to fix things, which isn't the truth at all, but it's all you can truly see when you're sitting in a dark corner and you're not looking around at the light. Those words were gonna go on to serve as a really haunting reminder of the struggles that Daisy had faced after her alleged assault, by the way. They are very present for me throughout this video, what she says there. And also, it talks really, doesn't it, of the unspeakably cruel way that people responded to her when they learned what happened to her. Because clearly, where Audrey is concerned, she took her own life. And we see again, Daisy in a situation where the same things occurred to her. And on multiple occasions, she tried to take her life as well. In 2017, that documentary won a really prestigious Peabody Award. It was called An Honest, Heartbreaking and Timely Account of Sexual Assault and Social Media and the repercussions that it has on young people's lives. Daisy also at this point began working on a film project called Saving Daisy. That was one that was meant to follow on from the point of where Audrey and Daisy ended, covering her journey with treatment, whether she was coping with post-traumatic stress, etc. And it was meant to be a story that was gonna really inspire other survivors to recognize that healing was possible. But then, unbelievably, and devastatingly, in June 2018, Daisy's brother Tristan was tragically killed in a car accident. Now this is compounded devastation. This is compounded trauma because that little brother of hers, Tristan, she described him as her best friend. So now she's lost her father. She's lost her brother and her best friend. She lost her innocence. She lost justice. She's dealing with this constant loss after loss after loss. In a post on Instagram, Daisy wrote, I've been posting a lot about our movie and how we need to raise a certain amount to make the film, but I really want to share how much this project actually means to me. Ever since the release of Audrey and Daisy, I've had so many of you survivors come to me and ask advice on healing. The truth is, I haven't healed the way I need to for years. I've struggled with my demons, I've put on a brave face because I simply cannot let down all the survivors who look up to me. I felt a responsibility to carry this weight so no one else would feel hopeless like Audrey did. I didn't come face to face with this until I lost Tristan. I've been using so many unhealthy coping strategies and mechanisms so I could just carry on and keep doing the work I'm doing. I've been living a life why I'm constantly triggered for as long as I can remember. I can't even remember the times where I wasn't living in constant pain and dealing with panic attacks or flashbacks. I'm not drowning, but just floating until something pulls me under water once more. I can't live like this anymore. I need to start this journey of healing. I can't even begin to imagine where she was when she wrote that. After her brother's death, she realized that she needed to try some other therapies to deal with her trauma. So she began EMDR, that's eye movement desensitization reprocessing. And it basically helps people to understand and process trauma. She also made a move to Colorado Springs. This is where she was working as a tattoo artist. She said that she wanted to really focus on the self growth, battling her demons, healing, and to just turn, as she said it, the dirt she'd been given into gold for her father and brother something that each and every one of us would wish for Daisy. However, sadly, that dream was never going to play out because on the 4th of August, 2020, Daisy killed herself. She was 23 years old, she killed herself. She died due to a self-inflicted gunshot wound. Her mother, Michelle, had actually called the police. She wanted them to do a welfare check on Daisy and police trained in crisis intervention had actually visited Daisy along with members of the fire department literally five hours before her death. They had made an effort, don't get me wrong, they'd spoken to her for an hour before leaving and it was said that they didn't place Daisy under a medical hold because they hadn't believed that she was suicidal at the time and she was also cleared by the medics. A lot of people will think, well, how is that possible? Because at the end of the day, she shot herself hours afterwards. But 
if there is one thing that I'm sure those of you who've been through an event where you've lost somebody that you love to suicide, you'll know that a lot of the time they're incredibly good at masking. They've kind of come to the conclusion they're going to do it. So all of the anxiety and fear has gone and now they're just intent on the focus. So even though I'd like to be able to say maybe the police and the ambulance people failed, it's likely they were just convinced that Daisy was okay. She probably did a very good job of acting as if she was gonna be fine because she was used to masking. She spent years masking the trauma as her Instagram post had said. So at 23, she took that last breath. We know the causes for suicide are complex and multifold. I know in my father's, they're complex and multifold to some degree. Maybe it's a combination of factors which leads someone to the end of their life in this way. But even though it's too simplistic to say that the rape alone caused the suicide, it is obvious it was a major reason behind it. Very obvious. And the way she was betrayed by her community. And I think it's fair to say that the rape and subsequent extreme bullying that she received definitely acted as a trigger for what would be a lifetime of struggling with her mental health because she was constantly trying to process what had happened to her and come to terms with it because the truth was she was always the victim. And yet she was being treated as if she was the person who'd done something wrong. Melinda was absolutely devastated, understandably, by the death of a daughter. She had lost her son, her husband, and now her child, who she considered her best friend. In a Facebook post honouring Daisy, she wrote, there aren't enough I love yous I could have said when I was holding your cold, broken, dead body. I held you like a baby anyway, my baby. The baby I held when you first came into this world is always been my greatest honour and joy to be your mother and best friend, Mama Bear. Ella Farron, who's Daisy's friend and also the fellow founder of Safe BAE, said that she knew it was important to Daisy that she wasn't defined by being a survivor. She described her as a very talented artist and said she was a strong female warrior for so many female-driven issues, and I think that's so powerful. She didn't want her friend to be defined by the crime that essentially destroyed her. Also, at the time of Daisy's death, she was dealing with a stalker. She'd also found out that she was unable to have children and Melinda described the suicide as being the result of a perfect storm. Now, you would think this story couldn't get any more sad. Sad's a word that is underplayed, but sad is such a powerful feeling, isn't it? so sad because on December the 6th 2020 just four months after Daisy took her own life Melinda her mother also did Daisy's death Sorry, guys. Sorry. It's just unbelievable that... Unbelievable that family can go through so much, isn't it? Anyway, sorry, I'll get myself together. Tell the story. It's just that when, when somebody kills themselves that you love, you want to die. Certainly when my dad killed himself, I wanted to kill myself. I totally relate to Melinda. That if it was a child, maybe I would have. I don't know. Everyone has different thoughts and feelings on this. Apologies. I imagine my eyeliner might have run. And I know that I cover stories all the time that are just equally traumatic, but there's just something about knowing where Melinda would have been and knowing the ramifications for those who are left. But Daisy's death had just been too unbearable for her. Oh, she died on the 6th of December, 2020. Safe BAE shared the news of a passing in a statement which read, the bottomless grief of losing her husband Tristan and Daisy was more than she could face most days. 
She'd actually posted on Facebook a day before she died saying, I'd like to challenge everyone to be kind and lift up others in pain, especially sexual assault survivors and those hopeless in this holiday season. Send out light and love and protect each other. And I will protect and pray for anyone who needs it. Let's make this a daisy day filled with light, love and hope. It's so sad that 24 hours later she took her own life. Survivors of sexual assault are 10 times more likely to attempt suicide compared to people who haven't been sexually assaulted. In addition to this, it's also been found that the risk of suicide was three times higher in families who've experienced the suicide of a family member compared to bereaved families of non-suicide deaths. To be the victim of a sexual assault is harrowing enough, it goes without saying, but to experience the extreme bullying, which went on to extend to the rest of her family is appalling. You can't begin to imagine the pain of going through something so traumatic than have the people not just fail to believe you, but to actually make you the person who's the perpetrator. And the fact that her perpetrator didn't even have a day in prison, didn't serve an adequate sentence, again, that victimizes you further. She must have felt injustice every single day. This is such a devastating case because it shows you how a perfect family can have these events destroy everything that should have been, change the narrative entirely. And my God, my heart goes out to Logan and Charlie. They're David's surviving brothers. They've lost both parents and their brother and their sister. And I hope that they have the support that they deserve. It is unbelievable to me that this tale ends not just with one horrific outcome, but with so many. Sorry for not holding it together as I usually do, but it just feels like there was so much to unpack. I wanted to do Daisy Coleman, Melinda Coleman, all the family justice. So I hope that if you have known this case, you've still come away from this video knowing more and certainly sharing and holding and cradling some of the pain that that family has endured. Because I genuinely think it makes a difference to this world when we send out our compassion and prayers to people who in this case are left picking up the pieces of a life that has been all but destroyed. And hopefully those boys will be creating something beautiful in their worlds, much that they deserve as well with respect. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. I'm sure some of you identify as sexual trauma survivors. A lot of you get in contact with me regularly anyway, and I know these things mean a great deal to you. I know that some of you might have felt personally affected by this because you've also been victimized online. And I know that a lot of you have sadly endured suicide within your family network and close friendships, because again, you always talk to me about these things too. Let me know. Take care guys, be safe.